production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Donald Ford, Chief Medical Officer at Better Health Partnership, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the Chief Clinical Transformation Officer from University Hospitals, Dr. Peter Pronovost. Dr. Pronovost is a world-renowned patient safety champion, critical care physician, prolific researcher, and global thought leader, informing United States in global health policy. His work levering checklists, to reduce catheter-related bloodstream infections has saved thousands of lives and earned him accolades, including being named one of the most, uh, 100 most in influential people in the world by Time Magazine, receiving a coveted MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, and being recognized as one of the most influential executives and physician executives in healthcare. Throughout his career, Dr. Pronovost served in a variety of roles including founder and director of the Johns Hopkins Med Medicine Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality, and as the Senior Vice President for Clinical Strategy and Chief Medical Officer for United Healthcare. In October of uh, 2018, Dr. Pronovost became the Chief Clinical Transformation Officer at University Hospitals, where he is responsible for strategic initiatives to improve value across the health system. Today, He'll discuss the need for new narratives that describe how success in healthcare evolves from healing in hospital to getting healthy at home. Dr. Pronovost earned a bachelor's degree from Fairfield University, a medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and a PhD from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Pronovost. best epitomizes what we're trying to do in healthcare. And Robert said, some people look at what is and ask why. Others dream of what has never been and ask why not. And my friends, that's what we're trying to do with healthcare. You see, you are blessed with brilliant healthcare systems in C Cleveland and they perform miracles every day. And yet that same health care system has preventable harm from errors as the third leading cause of death, third leading cause of death. And if you add our failure to treat hypertension, to control diabetes, obesity, lung cancer, or smoking, preventable harm is by far, by far the number one cause of death. And the solution isn't waiting for a cure. It's right here in our community. Medicine today leaves two in 10, up to four in 10 patients leaving their interaction with healthcare saying, I wasn't respected, I wasn't listened to, and I'm scared because I don't know what to do when I leave. Medicine today squanders a third of every dollar we spend on therapies that don't get patients well, a third. Nationally, that's a trillion dollars. Locally, that's $10,000 per household in America, $10,000. That's more than the median net worth of the zip codes of the people who live around here who we serve. And what we've seen is that if you look at every payer of health care, the federal government, state government, employers, and us as individuals, our health care costs 
are going up more than our revenues. And that's not a sustainable trajectory. And the states that have expanded access to care, and I believe that a country as rich as ours should give access to care, they've funded health care, but it's been at the expense of every other social good. So their STEM programs got cut, their preschool programs get cut, their elder care program gets cut. So not getting this health care thing right isn't just health care, it's truly the future of the American dream. And we're going to talk about how to change that. And it's not some fancy technology that we're looking to. It's the stories that we tell. The stories that we tell. Because stories are the most potent force for change in the world. Because they drive how we behave. For our students, stories, whether you see yourself as powerful or powerless. For our organizations, whether we see each other as competitors or collaborators. You change that story and you change everything. Stories like JFK, I Want a Man on the Moon, or Martin Luther King's nonviolent protest. They, they, they changed the world. We in healthcare have some dysfunctional stories that are holding us back, and I would love Cleveland to reframe those narratives. So I'd like you to think of the words, I will. I will. Because you see, though I'm humbled and honored to come and speak with you today, I much more care about what we do after we hear this discussion. So I'd ask you to either at the presentation or as we go back in your communities to think about your I will statement. Because these healthcare statistics that I just said, and it's even worse if you're a minority or you're poor, those health disparities or inequities are far greater, isn't just a clinical issue, it's a moral issue. A moral issue that we have collective responsibility to do something about. So I will. The first narrative that is holding us back is that we still accept harm as inevitable rather than preventable. My friends, there's almost no other industry that accepts defects as the norm. Imagine an airline saying, oh, some planes are going to crash, and yet we do that every day in healthcare. We, we say we don't, but it's not true. If we really believed, we wouldn't have preventable harm as the third leading cause of death. My own personal journey towards preventing harm began humbly in 2001 on a snowy night in a dark corner of the pediatric ICU at Johns Hopkins when adorable little girl Josie King, who looked hauntingly like my daughter, was taken off of life support and died in her mother's arms. She was burned, but was healing and was supposed to go home that day, but a catheter infection sacrificed her. Now at the time, these infections, if you can believe it, killed more people than breast or prostate cancer. This one little type of preventable harm was a public health problem the size of breast and prostate cancer. And all the clinicians in the room will know, we just accepted it as the cost of business. We thought that when you care for sick people, Sometimes little girls are going to die, and she did. Her mother came to me and challenged us, and she said, could you tell me that this won't happen to my other daughter? And I said, no, I can't. But then she asked me something else. She said, Peter, what are you going to do about it? Will you knock down this closed wall or door in healthcare?" And at that moment, my narrative changed. And we did something at the time that was heretical. We declared a goal of zero infections. You see, at the time, most research in healthcare was all aimed at testing as Coke better than Pepsi. We wanted to find new things. What we did was flip it at the end and said, no, no let's start with zero infections and put together a multifaceted program that works at multiple levels and pulls multiple levers from different disciplines to get to zero. So we made a checklist of best practices. We changed the culture by getting nurses to question doctors if they didn't use the checklist. We made it easy to comply with the checklist. We changed the supplies that were in the kits. We fed data back to the system. We held the clinicians accountable for their infection rates. And those rates went to zero. And then partnering with national partners at CMS and ARC and CDC, 
partnering with local partners within state hospital associations, health department, and individual hospitals. These infections that used to kill more people than breast or prostate cancer have now been eliminated or reduced 90% across the U.S. Just think about that. A problem the size of breast cancer was solved not with new knowledge, but by just freeing up the wisdom that existed in the communities. A problem the size of breast cancer. So we got curious and said, what led to that change? Because if you could find out what worked in this, we would have a really potent force for change. So we partnered with some anthropologists, some sociologists, and we interviewed people to see what was different. The press said it was all this checklist stuff. My hunch was it was something deeper, something more human than that. And when you spoke to clinicians about what happened, you can see in their eyes what they believed in their heart. What they all said is we started telling a new story. We used to say these infections are inevitable and I'm just a, and you fill in the blank. I'm just a student. I'm just a resident. I'm just a nurse. I'm just an attending. And they accepted it. And what got to zero is when they said, no, no, these infections are preventable and I am capable of doing something about it. Indeed, for the students, I think that phrase, I'm just a, is the most destructive phrase in society. So we got curious and said, well, what makes people tell new narratives? Because again, really powerful force. And what it turns out, it's two simple things. Two simple things. Believing and belonging. Do people, often the leaders or the community leaders, believe that you can get to zero so they infect that belief in others? And do they belong or do we create where people belong to peer learning communities? The power of beliefs is probably best illustrated in the story of Roger Bannister breaking the four-minute mile. You may know for 2,000 years, leading scientists said it was physiologically impossible to break the four-minute mile. You will die trying. In 1954, Roger Bannister, as a medical student, go tribe, broke the, the record. Now, he didn't die, and you may know that, but what's often not known is the next year, 12 people broke this 2,000-year record. The next year, 156 people broke it, and now high school kids are in Ohio have broken it, and the last New York Marathon, the person ran the whole 26 miles at a four-minute mile pace, right? So, so what changed in 1954? It wasn't new sneakers, as the students may believe. It wasn't <laughs> blood doping. It wasn't evolution. What changed was their belief. Bannister freed all of, uh, all of us up to break that four-minute impossibility, and that's what we need to do. The second part of creating that new narrative is, is having structures where people belong together, where I could see how good you are, and you could see how good I am, and we could begin to learn together. It wasn't economic incentives. It was peer learning. And the story of that is probably best told from Mary Poppins. No. How many of you have seen Mary Poppins? Hope all of you well. As you probably know, a very prominent feature in the background and the foreground is uh, the birds chirping throughout all of London, whether she's skipping. And, and that's because London in the late 40s was filled with two type of melodious songbirds, the red robins and the blue tits. And they thrived in downtown London because they used to peck through the tops of the milk containers that were left on people's steps. They sucked out the fat that was on the top of the, the cream on the top, and there were these really chubby, really happy birds who were singing a lot. Right? But then the milk companies changed the tops, and the containers evolved from cardboard and steepled to aluminum and flat. And it meant the birds had to learn a new way of pecking. They had to tuck their beak a little bit diff differently. And both birds were equally smart, and a few of both birds learned the new technique. But the red robins are extinct now in London, and the blue tits thrive. And the only difference were the red robins were solitary birds. They had their stoop or their corner. We call it our department, our organization, our own not-for-profit. And that wisdom never disseminated. Wisdom was there. It just died out. The blue tits were flocking birds. They fly strong and proud together. The wisdom quickly disseminated, and they thrive today. 
And folks, when I think about how we're going to get this new narrative of solving these healthcare problems, we have to stop being red robins and start functioning more like those blue tits. Second narrative is we say healthcare is a system, and indeed we use that word all the time. Some of it's even in our name. Healthcare is the furthest, furthest thing from a system. The furthest thing. You see, a system is a set of parts that interact to achieve goals. The healthcare systems in America have bought or built the parts, but they're not aligned around a goal, and they certainly don't interact to achieve a system. If you look at what systems would look like, they would be organized around patients' needs. And any of you who have had, ever tried to navigate, for example, a cancer journey, we often organize that care brilliantly around medical oncology, surgical oncology, radiation oncology, but the patient is challenged with working through a web of connections trying to coordinate their care. Or a, cancer, a patient with sickle cell, who pain is a prominent part of the disease, and if they're on pain medicine, gets kicked out of the sickle cell clinic because they take longer. Why? Because that person who's managing the sickle cell clinic is under really heavy production pressure to keep their RVUs up. And these complicated patients, well, they don't make my RVUs look so good, so I can't keep caring for them. So we send the patient to the emergency department to get care. And from managing the part makes a lot of sense. They're incentivized to do that. For managing value, or the patient-centeredness, it's the worst place you can go for care is to go to the emergency department, but we haven't worked to be a system. In a system, every employee, every person, would see their role as driving value. That's what great industries do. Healthcare isn't there yet. I learned this firsthand when I was studying these organizations that work as systems or what are called high reliability organizations. That is places that work in really hazardous and dynamic conditions but somehow pull it off flawlessly. So I visited an aircraft carrier and to give you a picture, they're a ship the size of a football field out in the middle of the ocean pitching in 60 foot waves at 30 degree angles and they land a plane with enough bombs to blow them all up every three seconds with like a foot to go at the end of runway, every three seconds, boom, boom. So I asked the Admiral how they do that. And as I'm speaking with the Admiral, there's a gentleman sweeping the deck standing next to him. Now, on the power hierarchy, that guy sweeping the deck is way below the Admiral. Much lower education, much lower pay, much lower power. But on the safety hierarchy, they're exactly equal. Because if there's a hammer or debris on that runway and a plane comes down and they hit it, they're all toast. I asked that gentleman what job he did. And I was blown away. He stopped what he was doing. He stood up tall and proud. He looked me in the eye and said, Sir, I help planes take off and land safely to serve the mission of the United States. I said, Wow, that is leadership. I left that, this was when I was in Baltimore, so it's the same here in Cleveland, and I asked an EVS worker, the people who clean the hospital rooms, what job do you do? The dynamic is exactly the same, right? Power, pay, much lower than the CEO. Safety, exactly equal, because if those rooms aren't cleaned, you get C. diff, you get MRSA, and you could die. And what did that, in this case it was a woman, say? She looked away almost shamefully, shame on us, and said, I clean rooms. She said, no, no, you prevent infections. That's what you do. I went to a call center and said, what job do you do? They said, oh, I answer phones. I said, no, no, you're a healer. You prevent cancers. You get people into needed care. But we haven't engaged people uh, in that way. If we were a system we would have much more co greater collaboration around this common purpose because right now when we just had a fabulous meeting with the Better Health Partnership, there's brilliant stuff going on in Cleveland. And frankly, the resources and the ideas to solve the problems are right here right now, but we're all two red robbies and we're not blue boobies, right? We're, we're optimizing our own piece, but at the expense of serving the whole. And we haven't organized it around the needs of the people we serve. Because the people we serve don't just have the one need that any one of these not-for-profits might offer. 
They have housing needs. They have transportation needs. They have foozing needs. They have health care needs. They have education needs. They may have need for technology. And we need to begin to focus those efforts on them. But most importantly, they have wisdom and strength and power. And we need to draw from that and not work with our community partners with answers, but go to them humbly with questions as servants. The third narrative is that this value thing is not really my responsibility. Right? Even though we waste a trillion dollars, I do my niche. I see patients in clinic, and then they go out when they happen, whatever it is. I operate on people. Not my challenge. By value, by the way, we're defining it as quality of care provided plus the patient experience divided by the annual total cost of care. Why annual? Because that's what the people who pay for health care look at. And right now, as I mentioned, every one of those people who pay for care, the federal government, the state government, employers, and us as individuals out of our pocket, our health care costs are going up more than our revenues. Right? And that's math that doesn't allow us to be successful for very long. Right? That can't keep going on, and yet we don't collectively say, Whose responsibility is it to, to, to address that? So we still have pieces of the system. I work on my clinic, but sacrifice that value, which is why we have, for example, nationally, heart failure patients have about a 40% readmission rates at 90 days. 40%, right? Huge waste, but we haven't collectively begun to solve that. We all need to own that new narrative. Now, this seems like a scary journey, and it is because like any of these collective human endeavors, we're faced with what the political scientists call the problem of many hands. That is, there's no real collective responsibility who's responsible for it, and yet no individual responsible either because it's so big I can't do it. And finding that balance of what are our own responsibilities for this piece, and I think the only way for that is each of us as individuals and as organizations to own that goal of driving value. Now, if that seems like a scary task, uh, it sure is. And as my new role at UH and trying to help navigate that, it's really, really scary because there's not a lot of path to go forward to do it. And yet I take comfort. And though this work might be new, the values that lead to success are old, very old, and they're very human. Indeed, after all my work in driving quality, I've learned that the secret of driving this value is love. Love. And by love, I don't mean a 50-year marriage, though there certainly is love in a 50-year marriage. By love, I mean what the psychologist Barbara Friedrichsen describes in her brilliant book, Love 2.0, is that love is micro moments of positive connection between two or more people, micro moments. The idea is I feel warm towards you, you feel warm towards me, and we create energy. So a micro moment is listening to a student who's excited about an idea. A micro moment is putting a hand on a worried patient. A micro moment is respecting that person who has a substance abuse a disorder and honors where they come from. A micro moment is a respectful smile to that homeless person asking for some change. You see, this big change that we're embarking on is the sum of hundreds or thousands of small ones, and every one of those is facilitated by a micro moment. Because change progresses at the speed of trust, and trust grows when we do things with rather than to others, and that happens through micro moments. And the beauty of these micro moments is that they are contagious, truly contagious. What we know from the sociology literature is that if you put a fit person on a team, not only is that team more likely to be fit, so imagine it in a table, but the next round of tables, your friends, friends, and then a third ring out, their friends, friends, the treatment effect goes down, but you infect those behaviors. You put a jerk in a team, same kind of negative thing happens, right, which is uh, one of the risks we worry about what's going on in this, with the culture of this country. 
But you put someone who creates micro moments, micro moments, and you could infect micro moments in others. I learned about the power of these micro moments in a very unusual place, Dunkin' Donuts. Now, as an intensive care doctor, I would typically stop by Dunkin' Donuts on Sunday morning to buy bagels or donuts for the staff, uh, not that they need them, on, on Sunday morning. And at, in Baltimore, the Dunkin' Donuts I stopped at was in a poor section of town, and it was right across from the homeless shelter, and there was a ramp, a highway ramp outside of it, so it was protected from the elements. So Dunkin' Donuts, as a warm place on a Sunday morning, was half homeless people and half people going about their work on a Sunday morning. And I walk into line to get some donuts, and there was a homeless couple in front of me. Can't say I've seen a homeless couple before. And they were dirty, yet deeply in love. And they were reaching in their pocket because they were hoping they could afford the heart-shaped donut with pink frosting. You may see Dunkin' Donuts releases at Valentine's Day. And they were a nickel short. And the woman said to me, hey, could you give me a nickel? And I was feeling a bit guilty about buying bagels for people who most didn't need them. And this was probably their only meal they're going to have for the day. So I said, you know, I'm getting an order. Why don't you just order breakfast and tell them to put it on my tab? So they went up to order. And the cashier must have thought they were going to be stiffed for the money as they ordered their breakfast. Said, you can't order all that food. You, don't, you can't pay for it. And the guy made a scene and said, no, no, the guy behind me is buying me breakfast. And I said, yes, I'm buying them breakfast. Let them get whatever they want. Well, the nurse standing next to me said, well, that's a really cool idea, and turned to the homeless person next to her and said, could I buy you breakfast? The <laughs> cop on the other side of me said, hey, could I buy you breakfast? The Sunday school teacher behind me said, could I buy you breakfast? And this love cascade within 30 seconds went seven people deep. It was like probably one of the most emotional experiences I've ever had in my life. And I was walking out, and the couple said, hey, would you speak with us? And so I said, sure. And I sat down, and they said, you know, we're not nobodies. We just made some bad decisions in our life. And I said, haven't we all? He said, but we're going to get our act together. And I said, I so believe you will that do me a favor. When you do, go buy somebody else breakfast. So fast forward, February turns into June. I'm back in Dunkin' Donuts on a Sunday morning buying some breakfast. And the cashier says, hey, Doc, some guy left this note for you. And on a little wrinkled piece of paper written in pencil said, I bought somebody breakfast. <laughs> I, I uh, left that ex experience. And the topic of rounds that morning was love. Now, those of you who are in academic medical centers may know love isn't the most common topic of discussion on rounds. <laughs> but it's so powerful as we're talking about it. One of the environmental services worker at the time spoke up on rounds and said, you know, Peter, I used to be one of those homeless people. Right? Our own employee and what I would have given to have someone believe that I would get out of this Ford. So my friends, the power and the wisdom to solve this healthcare problem that we have is all in this room, and it's certainly in Cleveland. The question is, do we have the humility and the courage and the curiosity and the compassion to live it? Because I hope you remember that though we think about this efforts we're doing, we recognize that the smallest act of love opens that door just a little bit more. And I think it's time that Cleveland throws that door wide open. So I thank you, and I'm happy to take questions, and I hope you complete your I will statements. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club. Today we're enjoying a forum with Dr. Peter Pronovost, Chief Clinical Transformation Officer for University Hospitals. We're about to begin our Q&A with all of you. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our live radio broadcast or our live stream at cityclub.org. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today, our content coordinator, Bliss Davis, and our marketing and outreach coordinator, Julia Wong. May we have our first question, please? 
Yes, I just wanted to ask you, sir, um, I imagine you've worked with a lot of foreign-born healthcare workers, and I imagine if they've come from tough circumstances, they're generally positive generators of micro moments, right? Yes, exactly right. I mean, healthcare is a diverse community of healthcare workers, and that diversity adds strength. We make better decisions, we get better ideas, uh, and it makes organizations perform better. So thank you. I am blown away by your presentation. I'm a parish pastor, and no one, including me, have ever spoken the truth as clearly as you have. So how do you encourage us to do more? Great, thank you. I, I'm not a pastor, and I've uh, no doubt I could l learn a lot from you. Um, you know, when I think about when you say you've spoken the truth clearly, these truth that I spoke are eternal. And this is nothing new. Like this, this grounding what we do in love is very human, and it's very ancient. The scary part is being comfortable talking about it. Like for, I'll share with you. When I first did a surgical grand rounds talking about love, I thought I was going to like, what are you, nuts? <laughs> but the reality is it, people connect with it, right? They're, they, they're human. It's what, it, it's what binds us together. And so I think we need to, to go out and you know, live the values of humility, curiosity, and compassion and not get tied up in the righteousness, the disinterest, and the disdain that too often I think we, we, we're, we're surrounded with today. So thank you, and I'll be your disciple. Students and I from Solon High School really enjoyed your speech. Can you speak to the role of how automation is changing the narrative uh, for healthcare that you spoke about? Yeah, so great and brilliant question. Let me just uh, frame that um, context for you. Healthcare, I mentioned that you know we waste a third of every dollar, a trillion dollars on things that don't get people well. We also, though, are the only industry that spends heavily on technology, like ridiculously heavy, and has negative labor productivity. Negative labor productivity. There's, there's, there's literally no other industry that has the lack of that. So I'll give you an example. When I was at Johns Hopkins Hospital 30 years ago, 1,000-bed hospital, same number of discharges, was staffed with 3,000 people. Today, for a bunch of reasons, largely because of technology, same number of discharges, Yes, we're doing, well, they were doing more sophisticated stuff, is staffed with just under 12,000 people, right? That, that growth, it doesn't exist in any other industry. They're going the other way. But we haven't leveraged technology f fully for that. Now, it's not that technology it, it can't solve these problems. What I think we've made the mistake of using technology as a loan rather than fitting it into a human system to support that human system. Right? And the EMR is the best example, the electronic medical record, where it was largely developed outside of clinicians by engineers who said, you will work, you will use this. And the clinician said, yeah, but it doesn't fit my workflow. And, and he said, okay, but we bought it, you will do it this way, you know, as opposed to designing it around the needs. Now, for the students, I would, and for the, the researchers or the entrepreneurs, there, if, there's five simple technologies that if we solved them could get 50% labor productivity growth in hospitals, 50%, right? Th think about the money that we would save because our labor costs are at least 60%. First one, very simply, is right now nurses answer a false alarm every 90 seconds, right? Think about that, why? Because every machine has their own alarm and they all try to be get the attention, so you buy them, but they're not prioritized to what's the greatest risk. So the, the least important alarm often gets the most attention, unlike any other industry where every alarm is integrated. So if you look at a cockpit, they don't have a thousand bells and whistles going off, they all get integrated. What we have in healthcare would be as if I was building a plane and I went to Boeing and said, okay, I want a plane, and the person who makes the landing gear says, okay, you can have landing gear, but I'm not going to send a signal uh, to the cockpit whether the landing gear is up or down. That's my data. I, I own the data. I'm not going to do interoperability. The pilot's going to have to look out the window or hope that, uh, that he can tell if the landing gear is up or down. And then Boeing would say, okay, well, 
People will die. It'll cost us a lot of money, but that's okay. It's your data. We'll still buy it anyways, right? And, and that's the way we bought technology for a large part. Instead of saying, no, we're not going to accept that you're not sharing data. You have to interface. Second opportunity is nurses spend 22% of their time answering, excuse me, manually double-checking medications when you could do an electronic double-check. Nurses spend 24% of their time hunting for supplies because nobody managed the last 10 feet of supply chain. All clinicians spend about half their time documenting in the medical record. Adds no intrinsic value than documenting, and it could be automated, but we haven't done that yet. And then healthcare spends about 20, 15 to 20% of our time on administrative cross-processing claims. I hope with our sponsor that we, we, we need to get billed, but there's every and payer does it a different way. It's often manual. And those are all labor costs and productivity costs that add no value that we could free up to solve this healthcare problem that we have. So great question. The bottom line is these are human systems and technology can't be viewed as a loan and there's huge opportunity. It has to be part of a socio-technical system that it's guided by the way people work and technology accelerates that. So I hope the students and the budding engineers and scientists help solve some of these problems. Question on the, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, your point about systems is spot on. Um, I would think that the hardest part of changing any of that is the people. And in your example about the trust being developed between the nurse questioning the doctor, what have you found to be the most effective way to instill that change in culture and people getting to that comfort level? Yeah, great question. And it's really key because, uh, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that we, in this work, we draw from a lot of di different disciplines, economics, behavioral economics, sociology, political science, epi, you know, uh, informatics. And, you know, if you look at all national U.S. policy, it's done from the mental model of this is an economic problem, right? I change the economic levers and we're going to solve this problem. And we do need to align the incentives. I'm not diminishing that. But that alone is incomplete because the biggest barrier, as you said, is people. It's how do I get people to come together and, and collaborate? And that is one of, of trust, as you pointed out. And in my own world, is once you align around that common purpose, the, these problems are easy. I'm mean, not, not to diminish the science, but like getting the data to talk to each other, other industries did that 30 years ago. Right? The, it, it's the, the, the politics of getting it together. So how do you do that? Well, I don't know, but what my heart tells me and what I've done in the past is first intentionally align around a common purpose. Right? This is what we're all going to do as Cleveland, as a health system. Two, is agree on norms of behaving. And my belief is that you have to be guided by being humble, curious, and compassionate. Because what often is the barrier is this hubris that I have all the answers and none of us alone do. But you, So this humility of, hey, I'm confident and courageous to, dri to drive up this mountain, but I'm humble enough to recognize that I need others to help uh, bring us along. I, you know, I'll share with you the story of probably one of the most powerful leadership examples I have. It's when I was around your age and I was on a camping trip and we were sleeping at night trying to decide which of several peaks we would climb the next morning and they broke us up to three different groups and each group had a different counselor and the first counselor walked into the boys and said you see that hill that's what we're going to do and then proceeded to give an hour-long lecture to tell them how they were going to do it, and they failed miserably to make it. Second group came in. I think the guy may have been high. This was prior to pop being legal in some states, <laughs> and said, hey, dudes, a lot of cool places you can go climb. Go choose what you want. Didn't make it. The third group, the group that I was in, said, you see that hill over there? That's the Cirque of Towers. Now, it's got an amazing view from the top. If we get there, it's going to feel great, but it's going to be hard. We're going to have to work together and support each other and collaborate and figure it out in ways that you probably haven't been before. And that guy is the guy that made it. You see, too often we have leaders in those two types of camps. They're arrogant. They tell everyone. And instead of guiding on why and uh, why we're doing it and what the goal is and respecting how is in the community, they tell people how 
or the kind of laissez-faire, do what you want, no accountability. It's that third group, that unwavering commitment to the goal, but humble enough to invite everybody on that journey. And, and I think that's the kind of leadership that will allow us to bring people together. Because the, the will is in Cleveland. The will is in, in many of these communities. And the strength and the resources are in there, but they're in silos right now. We're still those red robins. And we need courageous people to align uh, around this vision of love. A student had a question over here I saw earlier. Oh. First off, thank you so much for your talk. It's been really insightful and quite an honor to hear you speak. Uh, I just had a question. As young people, what can we do uh, as a community, as a Northeast Ohio community, to help combat um, growing public health challenges such as congenital heart disease? Because they do present a growing cost um, to the population at large because so many more people are living into adulthood. And also a lot of patients are becoming um, lost to care statistics. You know, over 61% stop seeing their cardiologist or local health care pro provider after the age of 18 as it pertains to such um, disorders. So how as young people do we um, inspire the community to um, lead and generate and um, kind of flow with ideas um, so far as how to politically um, speak for such people and um, how to raise uh, money to fight costs? Great question. Leave the mic, please. How do you think we can do it? <laughs> so actually... Uh, <laughs> See, the wisdom is in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I actually do have an idea of how to do that. And so Pretty far, sure. two schools are involved, Shaker Heights High School and Gilmore Academy in Gates Mills. Uh, it's called Heart Raise, and it's a nonprofit organization that is very school-centered. So that's something, what, um, something that differentiates us from the American Heart Association, for example, or Amended Little Hearts, that it is so, so school-centric. And it really prioritizes educating young people and involving them within the community, um, as opposed to you know, simply um, just involving the adults. And so uh, you know, I, I really hope to um, grow this community um, and raise it up to something that's, you know, maybe has a chapter in almost every school in the Northeast Ohio area. See, you have the answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. You know, what I love about the approaches of the young people is, and I should have addressed in your question, one of the biggest barriers of working together is we're too often we judge rather than understand, right? And, and, and we would make so much more progress if we just assumed positive intent, right? And, and sought to understand people where they're coming from rather than judging them because almost everyone in healthcare wants to make this, this better. There's no <laughs> doubt whether it was the better health partnership, people want to do the right thing, but we often get in our own little niches and again, sometimes become righteous even about I'm right and you're wrong and we'll never make progress. The other piece that I would, uh, perhaps will make it as your student logo, there's this fantastic quote from the anthropologist Margaret Mead that I love that says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So go change the world. <laughs> other questions? Oh. Hi. Your talk was so moving, and you're so full of empathy and compassion. It's truly inspiring. I'm a teacher, amongst other things. I'm on the board of a nonprofit devoted to social justice mm -hmm. and action. And I want to ask you, how can we, as individuals and groups, inspire more people to be like you <laughs> <laughs> and figure things out like this and help the world in such big and beautiful ways? Well, th uh, th 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 thank, thank you. Uh, and uh, I would say it, it's following your heart. It's in all of us. It, it's the human DNA. The question is we sometimes, uh, by cultural norms, it's not common to talk about love or some of these things, and yet it's the most powerful force. Uh, and it, as you, as an, an educator, you know, these principles of believing and belonging apply to education reform equally as well as, as in health care. Right? Read, I'll share with you, is a book called The Person in the Situation that describes the story of Yuri Traceman, who taught first year math at UC Berkeley. And what he noticed was that minority students were failing first year math at much higher rates than the, the more privileged students. And as you probably know, if you fail intro to math, you are X'd out of a lot of high paying jobs in engineering and science and, and medicine. 
So Yuri got curious and partnered with uh, an anthropologist, and what he noticed was the students in those two groups, the successful and the failing students, studied differently. The successful students studied in peer groups, so they supported each other, and when they didn't know the answer, they got this contagious confidence from each other where they would support each other, as any of you have been in a group, in a peer group. The failing students studied alone. So when they didn't have the answer, they suffered their shame by themselves. The successful students also often had seniors or upperclassmen came in and say, we believe in you, you're just as smart as we, and, and the, the failing students didn't have that. So Yuri had a brilliant idea. He started a peer study group for the underprivileged students, and he called it an honors program. Right? Nothing changed but the belief. Right? Just the name alone says, I believe in you, that you're smart. The, the checklist was the same, study hard, study long, but the narrative changed. Right? What he said is that I believe in you. I, we gave you that contagious confidence, and so the students studied together, and within six months, the graduation rates of those Berkeley students was exactly equal to those two groups. Right? And it wasn't a resource issue. Right? They had all the resources they need. It was a believing and belonging issue. And so I think this opportunity to partner with education and, and healthcare and education working together and the parallels of what we're trying to do with health reform and education reform are exactly the same issues of how do we have measurement for accountability, how do you empower teachers but yet still have some st you know, standard tests and curriculum are exactly the same issues that having a broader dialogue and trying to mature these would serve all of us well. So thank you. Other questions, comments? I will statements. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Danielle Price. I'm uh, with University Hospital. Hi, Dr. Pronovos. Peter. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> um, you and I had a brief conversation before, but I'd like for you to expound a little bit more on population health, and primarily because it can mean two different things in the clinical world versus in the public health or community side. And you did a great job of um, unpacking that for me to help me understand. I think it would be good for the folks here to understand that. But also, I want to hear um, where you think the sweet spot is as to where the overlap is between these two, because we know that the key to improving somebody's health has to happen both in the hospital and outside the hospital. But we haven't quite gotten to the point of figuring out what that sweet spot is. So I'm just curious to hear your take on that. Yeah, great. Thank you. And. Um, it's a privilege to w work with you, by the way. Now, I mentioned this problem of many hands, that when you have a collective in Denver with no individual responsibility, things get murky. And I believe a big part of the stalling or the lack of as much progress as we could make in population health, and it's not that we haven't made great progress, is because we have been a bit sloppy in our language of how we talk about it. And, and w what I mean is that when I think of population health, we need to be really clear about four or th three things. Number one, what population are we referring to? Because for those of us who are from health systems, we serve four at least populations. There's those who we employ, and we're often self-insured. There's those who we care for, whoever walks into our doors. There's those we ensure that if we have some risk bearing, and there's those who we live with, right? We have responsibilities for all of those, but I can't tell you the number of times I was in a conversation about, quote, population health, and I was in one place in my head. The person, one, thought they was talking about those we live with, and someone else thought they were talking about those they employ. Right? And, and they're all important, but if we're not crystal clear about what we're talking about, we won't move the needle. Within each of those, we have to be really clear about what's our roles. We have varying roles in each of our stakeholders for those different groups. Roles might be economic development. Roles might be driving the value or providing care. Roles might be addressing social determinants of health. But we haven't been clear about those. And then with each role, saying what's our responsibility. And, and some of us as providers might have full responsibility for some of those roles. We may have partial responsibility for others. But being crystal clear about what we're trying to do um, is what is going to move us forward. Danielle, the other piece that you said is I mentioned about how we need to stop being red robins and being much more like these blue tits. When you look at what systems do, they hardwire connections between upstream and downstream resources. In healthcare, 
we've siloed the medical care piece of sending someone from home from the social determinants of health piece, often from the public health piece, you know, and, and, and some from the community health piece, and they're all essential for us to work. And so this breaking down those silos and aligning it is what's going to be needed. My belief is if we go to the people and see what needs they have, and then regardless of where that sits, get them the resources that they need to, to, uh, to help mature this. One of the ways that I, we think about this is eliminating defects in value. And it's all of our job to eliminate defects in value. My UH colleagues think I'm like checklist craze, because, which I am, but we made a checklist of defects in value. But if we think about what it takes to drive what we're trying to do, you could break this down into three simple components. Defects in how well we help people stay well. That is, do you get an annual wellness exam? Have you had all your immunizations? Did you get your cancer screenings? You know, as a country, we're probably 20% of people get an annual wellness exam. Right? Breast cancer screening may be 35%. Colon cancer screening may be up to 45%. What that means is we have many people with cancer who shouldn't have it. We have needless suffering because we can prevent it. You know, a classic example is cervical cancer. We could completely prevent cervical cancer if we did screening and immunizations, but we don't. Second domain is how well we help people get well. That is, if you have a chronic disease, and let's take diabetes, there's defects at every chain in that management of the disease. How well do, how often are we diagnosing it? For diabetes, for example, 40% of people who have diabetes are not diagnosed, 40%. Are you on the recommended therapy? Half the patients aren't on recommended therapy. Is your physiology controlled, meaning for diabetes, the risk factors are your hemoglobin A1C, your blood pressure, and your lipids. 13% of diabetics have those controlled. And then how often do you have needless healthcare utilization? That is, you go to the emergency department or the hospital, and that number is about 95% of diabetics get some care because those upstream defects failed. And Danielle, as you have said, many of the reasons why we don't, why we're out of our physiology might be, I can't afford my medicines. I don't have a ride to get to the doctor. I, I don't like how it makes me feel. I don't trust my doctor because of a whole bunch of historical issues that, that build distrust. And so all of us have to say, every one of those things is a defect that we have to address. What do we do in healthcare? We pick one measure like whack-a-mole and think if we do that, it's going to solve all our problems. And yet we wonder why we're not bending the curve is because we've been too simplistic, right? This is, again, my, this idea of implementation research. Start with the goal of zero defects and design a system that eliminates all of those. The last defect is how well do we manage an acute condition? And that's where there's awful lot of costs that are wasted. Example. Is care coordinated with the primary care doctor? Nationally, somewhere 2 to 3% of people leave the health or hospital with a PCP visit scheduled. Right? We know if you're sick enough to be in the hospital, you probably should get back into primary care, but it doesn't happen. Is what we're doing appropriate? The employers or the insurers in the group know the main reason we've created centers of excellence in healthcare is because every procedure that's been looked at 30% of it is inappropriate, 30%, whether that's joint replacements, cardiac procedures, cancer care, and creating centers of excellence is to steer people to those centers that do do appropriate as criteria and don't over-operate or don't do things that you don't need, but that's not available to, to most people. Is the, care, the site of service where we're giving care the highest value? Right now, 40% of patients are getting care in a setting that could be a lower cost and equal or higher quality with this idea evolving from being healthy and I mean, healing in hospital to healthy at home. Much, much of what we could do could be delivered in home, could be doing in lower cost settings, but we have the ED in the hospital as default and all those resources could be pivoted to drive better value. So you're spot on. This is, we have to align. We have to be clear about what populations we're referring to and begin to systematically think about eliminating these defects. Questions? Thank you. Thank you.
Today at the City Club, we've been participating in a forum with Dr. Peter Pronovost, Cleef Clinical Transformation Officer for University Hospitals. Our forum today is presented in partnership with the Better Health Partnership, and our forum today is also the Medical Mutual of Ohio Endowed Forum on Healthcare, made possible by a generous grant to our endowment from Medical Mutual of Ohio. Our sponsors today are Cleveland Clinic and Medical Mutual. We're delighted to have representatives of both the Better Health, Par of all three organizations, Better Health Partnership, Medical Mutual of Ohio, and Cleveland Clinic with us today. Thank you for your continued support, all of you, for our healthcare programming here at the City Club. Our community partner for our forum today is the Alive Inside Foundation. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by the Hospice of the Western Reserve and University Hospitals, as well as students from Solon High School and University Hospitals Health Scholars. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from Key Bank and the William M. Weiss Foundation, with ad additional support from the donors you'll find listed in our program today. I want to thank all of you for being a part of this today. You are helping your community be a stronger and healthier place. That brings us to the end of our forum. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Pronovost. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.